Uh, tonight's speaker is on my right, David McDonough. By way of a kind of spoken review of the second edition of Paper Money Collapse. Same title? Yes, same title, second then, edition. Then it's the second edition by the same author. Yes. <laughs> Detlef uh, Sch Schlichter. Very good. Very good. From uh, abroad. And um, the begin. Oh, well, it's wonderful to see the second edition so quickly of our friend's book, Paper Money Collapse. And uh, I think... Uh, the author has enhanced uh, the second edition by an extra 100 pages, and the extra 100 pages are uh, very interesting, very interesting indeed. Uh, now, um, he has an attack on a, a chap called David... Uh, uh, no, here Graeber. Graeber. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, but by, by sheer coincidence, uh, our friend who's going to feature in this talk... Uh, David Steele has got a made a talk on uh, Draper, uh, uh, yes, oh, yes, which is on the internet, mm -hmm. and uh, I think uh, Detlev and uh, David agree on this uh, on this topic at least. And uh, but Detlev has some interesting criticisms of uh, this uh, chap, David. What's his name? Draper. Draper. Beg your pardon. And. Uh, uh, Draper. So Draper uh, thinks, uh, for example, that, the, that there never was a bar... Better not, because it will go down to the level of question time. Oh, well, 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 well. <laughs> uh, I think more of pantomime. Well, it will be a question well, time. It wasn't pantomime, wasn't it, last oh. week? But, but, but uh, the... Uh, Draper uh, actually uh, denies that Bartok could ever take place, but uh, uh, Detlev uh, shows that actually, in fact, uh, he unwittingly... Uh, uh, recommends Barter, and he, unre uh, and, and he unwittingly thinks that because uh, what he uh, calls the gift economy, uh, which I think is a uh, uh, which is a, a concept I've come across any number of times over the last uh, fifteen years on various socialist discussion lists, um, would be in a certain sense a form of barter if, if the gift was exchanged. Although I do think that the vast majority of socialists who uh, like the gift economy are pretty uh, indifferent to whether the gift... It is a re really a gift economy, and it, it, it's not... Uh, if it did exchange, I think death of the right, it would be a form of barter, but I don't think that they uh, are too fussed about it, the, the gift being exchanged. But even then, you could say that uh, you are with your gifts uh, buying goodwill of the people you're giving the gift to. Uh, but, of course, they don't like that. What they don't like, what the socialists don't like, of course, is exactly exchange... So what they don't like is almost exactly economy. You know, they don't like uh, that which money does, of course, uh, whether it does it perfectly or imperfectly. It does actually uh, be a form of swapping, a form of barter, a form of tit for tat, uh, a, a, a form of, uh, of exchange. And this is exactly what the socialists don't like. And, the, and by the gift economy, they don't really mean... They're basically anti-economy. Although, of course... Uh, uh, it, it must be pointed out, there's another irony, I mean, Detlev's pointed out the irony that, they, that, they, that when it does work, when they do get an exchange, they've got a, a form of barter which they want to, de, which uh, the leading author, any of the anthropologists, wants to deny. Um, there's another irony here, which is perhaps even a stiffer irony. Uh, nearly uh, all of these socialists uh, criticise capitalism from an economic point of view. Uh, they want to say, on false premises, as a as matter of fact, but they want to say that capitalism is uneconomic, and they want to say that socialism is more economic. Now, of course, this has got nothing to do with the facts. However, it is what they want to say. In other words, they do actually think that capitalism is uneconomic and that socialism would be more economic, and this is their, and this is their main point. Uh, so, um, so I think that... Uh, I think I've said it before, uh, uh, ages ago, that uh, the basic idea of libertarianism, the, the, the liberal idea, is in fact the number one idea, the top idea uh, in society. And uh, y y it, 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 socialism isn't necessarily uh, an antithesis to it. When, say for example, someone like John Stuart Mill considers socialism, he considers liberal types of socialism. Uh, and, of course, John Stuart Mill also wants to, uh, uh, as, as many socialists do, want to embrace the market as well. He wants to embrace competition and so on. Uh, but he, he wants cooperatives. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he, he basically uh, wants a, a sort of socialism 
that doesn't involve coercing other people, which of course is a liberal source of socialism. But as we know, most socialists sadly uh, take up the jackboot, as it were, uh, be they Bolshevik, the Bolshevik jackboot, or the Nazi jackboot. And, uh, yeah, and they're far from, uh, from liberal uh, all, all too often. However, I do think that liberalism is, is, is about the top idea. And so therefore then, uh, members of the Libertarian Alliance arguing with other people are going downhill. They are actually uh, arguing with people who tend to agree with their basic idea, although of course they do think there are many rival ideas to the liberal idea. Uh, and of course they are statists and they, 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 uh, and they don't realise that the state isn't liberal. Uh, isn't illiberal. Uh, for example, most people don't realise that democracy is, uh, uh, is illiberal. Uh, insofar as you vote, you vote for, against other people. Most people don't understand that point. However, what I was going to say is this: uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Marxists uh, uh, have, think they have the solution to three main ideas. Uh, one of them is, of course, the problem of war. The second one is, of course, the problem of the trade cycle causing mass unemployment, and the third one is the disutility of labour. Uh, now, uh, you know, that, that is uh, that most people uh, don't enjoy their life, uh, their jobs, under the uh, uh, under what they consider to be the capitalist system. They think socialism is the solution to all these. Uh, in volume three of uh, Capital, Marx actually uh, expressed some scepticism <coughs> about whether uh, socialism can. Uh, solve the disutility of labour problem. Um, and uh, he um, said that perhaps uh, they, they would uh, arrange to work shorter working hours and so on. But, but uh, you know, basically, uh, in communism, that doesn't really make much sense anyway, because they can work as long or as little as they like. So, uh, so uh, you know, shorter working hours is you know, it's a pretty poor uh, uh, remedy. But anyway, uh, that, that's the issue to, so. Our second one is the, uh, the problem of war, of course, we can reserve for another time. Uh, uh, but we might note that uh, it isn't the case that, uh, that capitalism causes wars, as the Marxists say. On the contrary, it's nearer to what Cobden says, that free trade drives out war. You know, and the more interconnected the, uh, the world is, uh, the more globalised the world is, uh, the less there'll be money in, uh, to be made out of war, because you'll be basically uh, uh, destroying your, your, your own... Uh, you know, uh, your own goods, as it were. In other words, from the capitalist class point of view, there's no advantage in war. Uh, but then there never was. I mean, the, the whole idea. I mean, if if, uh, if the Marxists were right on this, uh, then of course the executive committee uh, of the capitalist class would soon be able to make some arrangement with all the other executive committees of the capitalist class to have no war, because we know full well that uh, that war is going to cut into profits on the whole. You know, that's as obvious as the nose on anyone's face. So, uh, you know, capitalism would be a society uh, geared against war. But, of course, uh, the, you know, the Marxists didn't really go into this very, very much, although they produced ma many pamphlets, I think, the pamphlets. So it didn't really get to the point. Uh, now, again, with the trade cycle, because uh, I was going to say to you, introduce uh, uh, this sort of uh, biographical type of uh, story, uh, I was converted to uh, Marxism on the, uh, on the idea that these three problems could be solved. Uh, and uh, as soon as I joined uh, uh, the Socialist Party, uh, I met uh, our common friend, David Steele, who, uh, uh, who, now I asked him all sorts of questions on all these sorts of questions, and he's very, very uh, vociferous in his answers to these questions, except one, and that was the trade cycle. He did an answer something, but he didn't answer very much on the trade cycle. And this left me rather hazy on the trade cycle. And I knew that the Marxist theory of the trade cycle went over the whole three volumes of capital. And it was not, uh, it was not immediately obvious uh, what, what it was. And I think basically that uh, Today, I think I tend to think there isn't really a Marxist uh, analysis of the trade cycle, apart from the fact that uh, basically you've got the anarchy of production in capitalism. And I think Marx is right on there. I think the market is basically an anarchy, uh, and he thinks that that will somehow or other um, uh, lead to uh, mass unemployment and slumps. Well, there's no reason why he should. I mean, uh, he, he needs a theory of the cycle. Now, of course, if you've got a theory of the cycle, you've got a You've, you've got a problematic uh, idea of, of, of whether something's intrinsic to, say, capitalism. Because if you've got a cycle, then you're going to have capitalism outside of the slump as well as inside the slump. 
So, and if something's really intrinsic to someone, something, then generally speaking, it's there all the time. For example, it's almost intrinsic to human beings. They have noses, so you find that almost every human being has a nose, that sort of thing. If you start getting uh, periods of time when you don't have a nose, <laughs> then the whole idea of intrinsicness... Uh, well, but you can have a, you can say the cycle is intrinsic rather than the actual slump itself, I suppose, and, and work it that way. However, Marx doesn't seem to have a theory of the trade cycle very, very much. Uh, you know, he, he, you could cut, can cut one together, but you'd be adding things to Marx in, in, in this. So when uh, David then um, uh, put forward to me uh, some, uh, you know, this was back in, in the 60s that I'm talking, when, when we get into the, in the 1970s and David put forward to me the economic calculation argument, then, um, you know, that was a bit of a headache, uh, and, uh, and uh, I, I uh, wasn't too pleased to hear it, really, but, but I thought I could solve it in some way or other. Uh, and, um, uh, but he then also introduced me to uh, uh, Mises, and, of course, also uh, a book called The America's Great Depression by uh, Murray Rothbard. And this has a, a theory, the Mises theory of trade cycle in chapter one, and the rest of the book is some sort of, uh, oh, um, but sort of history sort of thing, you know, it's not as clear as the first chapter which, which puts forward the, the trade cycle. So I was happy with this. This was, a, an, this was far uh, clearer and more cogent than Marxism. So I had a, had a nice theory of the trade cycle. Uh, but uh, lo and behold, you know, uh, that was about 1974. But lo and behold, around about 1980, David come again saying, well, I'm having doubts about this theory of the trade cycle. I've read this book called The Hayek Story, uh, this uh, chapter called the Hayek story, a chapter in uh, a 1967 book by John Hicks, uh, the, uh, uh, critical theories on money and credit. And so I got all of this and uh, I read it and it didn't make much sense to me actually, the first reading. And I've read it a number of times since, but uh, sadly, just lately, in the last year or so, I haven't been able to find my copy of this stretching book. <laughs> so I haven't been able to, I've had to rely on for this, for, for revising my account of it, a very slim account of it in this talk. Uh, and Hayek's answer to it, which is in New Studies, and it's the, uh, uh, the, the chapter called the, uh, the, the Ricardo Effect, on the Ricardo Effect, which reverts back to uh, uh, an earlier uh, uh, essay on the Ricardo Effect, which is uh, in, in Individualism and Economic Order by Hayek. Now, um, I've read th those two, and uh, I think the, the, the most dark uh, thing that uh, Hicks says um, is that he, he thinks that if, uh, and I actually preach it and, and doesn't give, any, you know, uh, can't credit it at all, he, he, he does think that inflation doesn't cause a uh, divorce of the natural economy from the money economy. He thinks that, uh, that after a while, the uh, money economy uh, uh, clicks in. Now, the theory of the trade cycle basically is this, that when we get inflation, uh, the natural economy is left behind and the money economy uh, comes to the fore, as it were. So people start trading in money. Now, of course, uh, the Keynesians say that inflation is a boost to the economy. Now, uh, I've had uh, a lot of doubts about this over the years um, uh, because uh, it seems to me that it can't be a, a boost in the sense that it's a, uh, a successful broadening. I mean, uh, I think both the Austrians and the... Uh, Keynesians agree that it sort of broadens the economy uh, and uh, the Keynesian thinks it's a definite boost to the economy, that the economy would be slack without this, uh, this inflation. But the, uh, the, the Austrians tend to think that it, it tends to think it messes up economic calculation for, for a kickoff, and so prices aren't as good as they normally are. They aren't, uh, they don't, they're not so naturalistic prices. You, you have a divorce between the natural economy where uh, uh, we'd say, for example, if you had no inflation at all, prices would fit the way our supply and demand actually is. But what the Austrians want to say is that uh, with uh, lots of inflation and continuous inflation, there is a divorce between what you might call the natural economy, the Wicks deed type uh, and the uh, Wicks sale type idea, and, um, the, and, and the actual money economy. And in the money economy, uh, you tend to get uh, signs looking as if there's been extra saving in the economy. And so you get malinvestment. Now, uh, this, of course, Hicks, by the by, was one of Hayek's students at the London School of Economics. And um, this puzzled Hicks for a long time, and it wasn't until 1967 that he wrote this Hayek story thing. And so he, he must have puzzled it in and out uh, over the years. Uh, 
puzzled it many times, but he suddenly comes up with a, uh, uh, a sort of dismissal. He, he basically says, and I will repeat one passage of New Studies, uh, where he says, uh, basically says, uh, repeats the David Hume type thing on inflation, uh, that the, uh, allowing no, nothing of the Austrian theory of, uh, of uh, the first people who get the money being extra well off and that sort of thing. He, he says basically the, the, uh, the money goes through uh, uh, the natural economy, the equilibrium, because Higgs is very strong on the equilibrium. Uh, the equilibrium uh, still pushes through from the natural economy into the, uh, through the inflated money, and you get a different equilibrium, but you do get an equilibrium according to Higgs. And the equilibrium is a, is a link to the real economy, or if you like, to the natural economy. So there's no divorce according to Higgs uh, between the uh, real economy and the natural economy. And although you've had inflation, you've had some disruption, you are back where the price system is working and you, economic calculation in so far as Higgs would consider that. Uh, he must have considered it because, as I say, he's one of our ex-students. Uh, and the, the, the old mm -hmm. socialist debate was there in the, uh, the LSE when he was a student and so on, and when he was a lecturer at the LSE. Um, that, that, he thinks, would be all right, even with inflated money. I think that's the sort of thing he wants to... Now, I doesn't uh, like this at all and, and uh, answers him. Uh, now, I remember David saying I read, I read Hayek's answer. I wasn't at all impressed by it. He says, uh, absolute nonsense, he said. Uh, yes, he, as he, you know, sometimes when he switches his, when he switches his mind, he, does, he, he switched it uh, pretty solidly. But anyway, uh, uh, what happened is that he announced this, and me and Bob, in fact, uh, decided to answer him in, in free life. What year was this? This was uh, in 1980, mm -hmm. 1981, just before the split. And it was, in fact, the split that I think made us think about other things. And in fact, free life itself didn't come out all that uh, as often as he should have done. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, we didn't get round to that article. And since then, uh, me, me and Bob are still more or less, we're still more or less on, notwithstanding the fact that I'm going to play uh, the devil's uh, advocate tonight and, uh, and, and, and uh, push it and uh, Tullock and one or two others. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I think that um, I'm still with the uh, Austrian theory of the trade cycle in sympathy anyway, I suppose. You know, I, uh, I take a long time licking my wounds. You know, it took me ages now. Well, it took me from 74 to 78 to finally admit that there might not be any proper answer to the economic calculation argument. But anyway, uh, so Hicks brings out this attack, and um, this is accepted by some people anyway. And then uh, other people search around, they find uh, Tullock's attack. Now, I did read through Tullock's uh, thing, uh, but I've largely forgotten. It's not a, it's not, it's about I don't, four pages, isn't it? It's not, it's not, it's not very long. The, the, the yeah. Hayek story is, is longer. Uh, uh, but the Hayek story seems to make one point, and that's the one point I've already made. Uh, whereas, uh, uh, as uh, Tethev says, there is uh, seven points to the... Uh, to the uh, well, uh, there's seven points uh, uh, to, to, uh, to this uh, uh, Tullock. Uh, the first one, uh, as um, Detlef says, is uh, why should inflation ever end? Inflation could go on forever. Uh, the second point is... It seems to be doing so. It seems to be doing so, <laughs> certainly, yes. I mean, Detlef even uh, says that this is not a bad point. <laughs> but, uh, it's not a blessing, uh, but it's, a, it's raining. Then he says, "Why?" Now, this is a point often made by uh, by our friends in uh, in the George Mason University, ah. uh, Kaplan and uh, the other chap, uh, Tyler mm. Cowan. Cowan, yes. Cowan. Um, why can't the entrepreneurs see through this inflation? This is the point they make in Mises, because they also have uh, uh, gone along with Pollock and uh, and uh, and uh, given up the uh, Austrian trade. I don't think that. Uh, I don't know whether you've seen the two or three clips that uh, Tyler Cowan has, uh, Tyler, Tyler has made of the, uh, on the internet. Have you seen them? I recommend you to read uh, I, I, I recommend you to have a look at them. I don't think they're very strong. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't think they're as strong as Tullock and, and uh, Dedlev says that Tullock's points are weak. <laughs> I, don't think, uh, I don't think they're as strong as Tullock's. Uh, but uh, this is one of them. Uh, uh, why can't the entrepreneurs see through this inflation? Uh, then uh, uh, the third one is, uh, it's not so much uh, a cycle as a random walk, meaning, I suppose, uh, that uh, 
it's, it's not going in a cycle at all. It's just continuing on and on and on. Um, this this uh, in, inflation. It's not a credit cycle. When I first uh, uh, read Rothbard on the trade cycle, I changed it from the trade cycle immediately to the credit cycle. So obviously, he's talking about a credit cycle rather than a trade cycle, uh, which I thought was more appropriate. Um, but the, what uh, Tullock's saying is not a cycle at all. And then the fourth point is uh, uh, low interest rates and inflation. By low interest rates and inflation, the state uh, gets uh, resources from uh, the consumers to the producers. He says, why isn't this just saving? Well, of course, uh, uh, one of the points drawn from Mises' 1912 book was the idea of forced saving. And this was eulogised eulogized a great deal by uh, Professor Lionel Robbins, the London School of Economics, in many books. And uh, even uh, after he, uh, he, he, of course, wrote a book called The Great Depression, put, put, putting forward the theory of the trade cycle. And he apologised for it. Later, after he was won over by Keynesianism, and he wasn't the only one won over, of course, there was Hicks and mm. a whole bunch of other, Carl Dorr, uh, Ballock, there's loads of them. And some of these people, Carl Dorr and Ballock, translated Hayek's early books into English uh, at the London School of Economics. But uh, they were all, the, I mean, the, uh, the debate was, uh, there was a big debate between uh, Hayek and Keynes, and um, I, d I don't think uh, Keynes won it from a logical point of view, but from a sociological point of view, from a social point of view, uh, Keynes certainly won it. And of course, uh, at, at the end, uh, you know, when round about 1945, there about 46. Hayek really was on his own in that department. You know, they'd, they'd, they'd all they'd all gone over to Keynes, and of course then he went off to Chicago. Uh, but if, even in Chicago, of course, uh, and uh, you know, uh, Detlef says that uh, Friedman is a, a Keynesian or a type of Keynesian, which of course he's quite right. Uh, it was Friedman among others who uh, who were against that, actually even giving. Um, I had a job in the economics department well, at Chicago, and he got he got a job. Well, I think I think Friedman more or less says it in in various places, places. and uh, uh, and it, uh, so you know he got a job as a moral philosopher. But but, but uh, so he was lost from a social point of view. Oddly enough, it was the top professor of statistics uh, arguing against the uh, professor of uh, of uh, economics, uh, Keynes, and. Uh, uh, Keynes was certainly an expert in statistics, <laughs> and Hayek was probably an expert in economics. But anyway, <laughs> that's a nice little line. But the whole debate is wonderful, and uh, what, what is uh, what was going to be happen if he hadn't died? Uh, but W.W. Uh, w. Barclay was going to bring it out in a volume, and that would have been great. Mm -hmm. uh, but sadly, he died, and so he didn't get around to doing that. Uh, but the whole debate really uh, is, is a debate worth having a look at. The Hayek Keynes debate. Uh, but, but anyway, uh, he was lost from, uh, in social terms by Hayek, if not from a logical point of view. Uh, you see, I mean, I don't think... It always um, puzzles me that uh, no sooner than they find a, a problem with uh, the theory of the trade cycle, they uh, the people like Kaplan and Cowan jump straight back to Keynes. <laughs> Why anyone would jump to Keynes, I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm willing to find uh, uh, problems with the trade cycle. I'm not willing to jump... Straight back to Keynes, uh, you know, uh, it seemed to me that Keynes was wrong from word go, but still, there you are. Uh, so anyway, uh, the, uh, so the, the, it seems to me that uh, we have got uh, with this um, almost anyone who advocates the Austrian theory of the trade cycle, including me when I've advocated it, uh, going for the quite nice idea. A pleasant idea that the longer the slump lasts, the more dire it will be. The more we put off the slump, the more dire it will be. Well, this is a, a nice paradox, uh, but is it is it true? Uh, of course, if Higgs is right, it's not true at all. You you have a, a clearance right away, even though you might have some upset to the economy. You do get back to market prices right away. Uh, and uh, you know, now I do think that uh, the market is remarkably rapid at clearing, unless something stops it from clearing. I also think this, that uh, the, the big problem with uh, the trade cycle is mass unemployment. Now, uh, we've had mass unemployment in this country since 1970, and um, 
although uh, we finally went off the gold standard in 19, around about 1970, the same sort of time, uh, nevertheless, we had the 1960s where we certainly had uh, fractional reserve banking and certainly some inflation uh, in the 1960s, uh, but we had uh, a period of, uh, of full employment. Uh, so I think that uh, the main problem with mass unemployment is what maintains mass unemployment. And I think what maintains mass unemployment is, in fact, uh, the dole. And I do think that... Uh, you know, if, if anyone reads, uh, for example, a book like The Ultimate Resource by Julian Simon, uh, although it's not on the problem of unemployment, it's quite obvious that what he's saying uh, is that uh, the amount of jobs out there are infinite. There is no limit to the amount of jobs out there. You know, the, the more people there are, there are the, uh, says Simon, for in, in Ray Percival's phrase, uh, the easier it is to feed them. You know, uh, there's no problem at all with finding new jobs for more and more people. Uh, and so uh, you have got the fact, and this is, the, the, I mean, the, the statists think that they, they, they take a Mal, Malthusian point of view that there's a limited number of jobs. And of course, Keynes also takes a Malthusian point of view that there's a limited number of jobs. And of course, then, if there is a limited number of jobs and people can't get jobs, then perhaps society does have a, uh, or, or people have a, you know, some obligation to the people who are unfortunate enough not to get jobs. But if there is, if uh, Ricardo's right, and there is a, or uh, Simon's right, or the, the, most economists are right, and the amount of jobs out there are infinite, then of course um, people can get jobs and we can have full employment. Uh, perpetually, if the trade cycle messes f uh, full employment up, then we don't have to, ma uh, then although we'll have to go through a period of unemployment, uh, we can soon get back to full employment again by not maintaining it. And I think the, uh, there's any number of ways where you don't, where, where you could even, where even the statists could provide a doll, yet uh, provide a doll that wasn't long lasting. I mean, if you provide the doll to give you uh, even a more generous whack than you have today, but there's an understanding that it's lowered by one pound a week. Now that's a soft way of doing. But you know, in 50 weeks you've got 50 pounds off, and so on, and it keeps going. That would be a, a sign of ratchet, a, a, a slow, which would which would tempt. Uh, the market to clear because you see ever since 1970 and you've had this mass unemployment people have this first of all there's a, there risen uh, some sort of idea of a race to the bottom which of course is unmitigated poppycock I mean it's complete nonsense this race to the bottom but people imagine it's true because of the million mass unemployed then they start talking about whether their children will get jobs when they leave school and so on you don't have none of this in the 1960s when the market was cleared Everyone knew that jobs were chasing workers rather than workers like, chasing jobs. I can remember when, in 1968 when I, uh, uh, when I was converted to, to socialism, I, I, I tended to insult one of the customers, I guess. <laughs> you know, because she said, painter, fetch that, that milk. I said, well, have you broke your arm? She's doing you know, It's not my job to fetch milk. I'm just painting it. And she says, this is insubordination, she said. And she's just a client. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll get onto the the, uh, the firm about you know, making complaints. I thought, well, all right, Mr. Gina. I still didn't fetch the milk and continue painting the. Uh, so uh, she did make a complaint. And so eventually, actually, I was sacked. And so I, I had to search for a job. <laughs> I had to search for a job. Well, jobs almost started after the phone at me. You know, I picked up a job. I said, yes, uh, come along. I said, oh, yeah, I thought, well, they're a bit far. Uh, Maybe there's a job nearer. So that's all. I found a Stokes's, which was just down the road. And uh, they said, yes, come along. I said, oh, all right. And I got along to the nearer one, Stokes's. I'm sure if I picked up a third time, I'll get a third job. I mean, the jobs were too, you know, the jobs really were chasing people in those days. And that's how it would be uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with a cleared market. And I think we could clear the market even if we didn't. You see, I'm fully in favour of denationalising money and uh, free banking and so on, which Detlev recommends in his book. But I think we, we uh, uh, and of course the sooner we do that, the better. But I think even before doing that, we can clear this problem of mass unemployment. And if we did clear the problem of mass unemployment, I think a lot more people would be a lot more optimistic. Now they, they you know, when I talk to them at the bus stop, they say, oh, Britain's done for. It was once a mighty country. Now it's done for. Look at how many unemployed there are. Uh, uh, kids will never get jobs when they leave work and so on. Well, that's bloody unmitigated nonsense, you see. There's any number of jobs for these people. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, the 
problem with the trade cycle is that it causes mass unemployment, but then that problem of maintaining mass unemployment can be a different problem. Uh, and uh, so we've got two problems here, but I'm, I'm in favour of solving them both, and I still think that it is the denationalisation of money in some way or other. I never did. Even when I gave a talk on that, by the way, I never did abandon the gold standard. I think that you probably would, a private bank would need gold uh, uh, to, to get to, uh, uh, to set it up. Uh, uh, Detlef says in one part of his book that uh, he thinks that it has been uh, tradition that uh, supported money and so on. Uh, I think all this is uh, what, what some people call the genetic fallacy. We never look, it's wrong to look at the origins of things. Uh, to find the actual uh, uh, how things start up, to find what actually can maintain them, you know, sometimes uh, uh, you know, uh, if we know something, we don't look back to how we first learnt it at school, say, or perhaps after, uh, to, to necessarily see whether it's right or wrong. We, we instead have independent tests uh, uh, according to what the doctrine is uh, about it now, and so uh, you know, the, the genetic fallacy, I think, uh, looking at how money originated, isn't. Got any, hasn't got anything to do with the new form of money getting accepted. So, uh, so I think uh, you know, that level uh, over uh, over uh, uh, eulogises tradition and so on in his book. Um, but uh, at that, I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll stop. I mean, the, the the big thing I think will be the writing up of this, which I only got a uh, the final writing up. I only got a third the way through, and I realised <laughs> I wasn't. Uh, yeah, the right now. Very but, good but, so far, David. Very good so far. But anyway, I'll, I'll hand it over to Bob now for summary. Uh, on Sunday, at our mutual gathering and drinking place, um, we discussed my put into this, this evening's session. And David thought I might be an overture, I might be a postlude. I have something to say that may be original or at least originally put about the trade side. Because we've all read the, the for and against, uh, one way or the other. And it, you know, you can get the sort of four step, three step, five step, whatever it is, Rothbardian, not very clever, that's how it works. You know, well, maybe. But um, uh, something I like to call, if it's original to me, and it's still original, even if someone else got the originality in earlier, as it were. It's still original to me, because I didn't have any help here. It's all my own work, however lame it may be. Um, right, so we're, going to, we're all a bit up, up on this subject. So we have the, um, we have the uh, uh, fiat credit expansion. It's not usually paper just chucked from helicopters. It's the banking system just extends loans of money that no one ever saved. They don't quite say this, but that's what they do. Because it's good for the economy or something. I don't know, it's flexibility. It's, uh, it's an elastic currency. Uh, my view is that um, if you don't want a concertina economy, you don't have an elastic e currency. That's an elastic currency leads to a concertina economy. So <coughs> leave it out, you know. If you had an entirely fixed money supply, my view is, and I look, well, I don't look for refutations because people don't deal with this idea very much. But um, with a fixed money supply that everyone has grown up with, got used to, the prices don't do very much. You know, some go up, some go down. You know, your wage is about what your dad got, but you know, or even slightly lower, but you can buy a lot more with it. That's, that's how an economy will work. So I've, um, I've gone into this, you know, because I'm allowed to, being a philosopher, taking my own time and my own angle on these things. And... Uh, my, my own view is this, ah, I had it, I mean, I've been inching towards it for some years, uh, Ryan and others, of course, but it's all my own work, given the, my reliance on others. Um, about a year or so ago, you may remember in this place, we had a discussion about Bitcoin. And there was a gentleman about there, who isn't there now, who said, Bitcoin isn't backed by anything. It's not backed by anything. Yes. Very Rothbardian, I thought. Yes. Well, yes, it is not backed by anything, but would you like a thousand Bitcoin? <laughs> uh, I would. Would you like a suitcase full of paper dollars? I would, <laughs> in the circumstances. Because it buys you stuff. It buys you stuff. Aha. Germinating the old bonds. 
I then realised, of course, it's not that bad. It's not that clever. It's not that old. You know, it's not at all hidden from anybody. That because um, if you take a kind of instant equilibrium approach, and it's quite right in a sense, printing more money doesn't make people wealthier. We all say this, and it's true. It's making a making a point. The prices go up. The rela exchange relationships remain the same. But in the less than medium and long run, and if you get it first, which is not which is fairly obvious, everyone knows this. Well, many people know this. Uh, you can buy more. So when there's a, a great splurge of um, credit expansion going, not simply that the interest rate is lowered. Uh, Rothbard and other um, Rothbardians make great play of the interest rate, and it is important, it is important, that the interest rate is lowered. And therefore, um, if you have a, not so much a natural production period that physically takes a long time, as they seem to be saying sometimes, it's just that you have a plan. I mean, you may have a ballet troupe that you can hire in a day and give them costumes in the next day, you know. So that's all there. It's all done. All the spending's done. But you have yet to earn a reputation, uh, bookings. So it might be that you have to run it at a loss for a while. So your, so your investment period, your financial period, is different to the production period. So, so the point is you have a, a, an extended financial period, but if you, if you can make it work, and of course the interest rate is important in this, so it's not a sort of physical production period that the lower interest rates, the um, fiat money created lower interest rates allows. It's not simply a physical one, it's a financial. It comes to the same thing. So, so it's, not, it's not just the interest rate which does allow things to be done that could not have been done. So the, the, fiat, the fiat money expansion lowers the interest rate. So things that could not have been done or appear doable and profitable. So yes, yes, they, they are now doable, apparently. But there is a great tidal wave, a great tsunami of fiat whoosh coming out. So it's not just the interest rate that distorts the economy, as it were. It's the fact that there's all this money out there. Now, it's undeniable that people who get this, this fiat credit first spend it. They can buy stuff. They can do things. And if we um, don't suppose that there's general equilibrium at all times, which I just certainly do not, and I don't think Austrians should, Austrian economists should, so there's a bit of slack in the economy, you know, uh, there could be overtime done, there could be all sorts of things, there could be women losing the, moving from the house into a paid, paid um, employment. They were paid for the husband, but it wasn't, it's not regarded as paid employment. There could be immigration. So it may be, as did happen over the last few uh, credit cycles, uh, business cycles, that there were the, this, all this labour would end to come forward. And it can work. See, people like Tulloch suppose that there's a kind of seesaw. So this great surge of money drags people over there. They spend their money in the normal ratio, which drags everything back. That's what Tulloch says. So how can you get a business? But it's not like that. They're spending away. Some people leave the home, come from abroad, work extra hours. Not all capital is being fully employed, you know, up to, up to the limit that it could be employed, hours in a day. So you can get a surge in both in production and consumption. Now, how is this? It's because if you're not charging enough, more can be purchased. If you're not saving enough to replace your capital, again, more can be purchased. They don't, they don't know, um, the capitalists don't know they're not charging enough. They don't know they're not setting aside enough. So the money is simply flowing towards them, as it were. They, they see this. So. But so everyone's spending as if they were in a, as if they were a wealthier population. Not simply a wealthier population, but a population that saved more. And they aren't. So the point is reached whereby either, if it's a fixed exchange, sort of fixed exchange economy, the pound has to be saved, therefore interest rates go up. Or prices start to rise, cost prices start to rise, and selling prices maybe don't do quite so well if it's tower blocks, let's say, in central London. So the point here, and 
I like to call this Mr. Layson's augmentation. If it's, if it's new, it may simply be saying what's been said before in different words. It may be simply a, an explication of the Austrian theory that it has some add-ons, but um, I shall claim it as my own unless someone else has it first, in which case I shall say I did it better. But can, can you see the point? This is how it works. This is how you can explain a business cycle, yes. avoiding the Tulloch uh, criticisms, that it can be done, but it cannot last. The country is not that richer. In fact, the, the most basic thing you can say is, so all of this money is flooded out. And businesses have been started, and people have been, even people coming from Broadway and hired, women go to work. I mean, more stuff's being turned out. So, compass, so consumption can rise. It's, it's not a fiddle, it's not a, it's not a, a, a mystery, a, a mirage. Yes, more people are working, more stuff's been chucked out. But the point is reached at which is the saving. And is the spending enough? So the spending has to buy all the output from the new and old capital. And the saving has to be enough to replace the established capital and the new capital. And it cannot both buy the product and replace the capital once, once it simply spent itself. And even increasing it eventually because interest rates go up to match, match the you know, match the credit expansion, match price rising. So that is uh, Mr. Layson's augmentation, for what it's worth. Now, <laughs> if it isn't new, at least it's newly performed, newly, newly done. Anyway, that's the chairman jump again, unusually, but I was invited. And now, <laughs> the question period, please. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll return to a point that Christian has made. I've never found such a subject answer to it yet. Oh. But, 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 but more Christian, so you may have had an answer, or definitely may have an answer. Um, and I've asked, I've asked several times, but I say I still haven't heard an explanation. If we had proper a money supply that was inelastic, oh. say gold, and we see general deflation as, as the economy becomes more efficient, prices are falling, how do we account for growth and return on investment? Because people invest and they expect a certain percentage of return, and the economy is growing. But if there's, if there's a fixed amount of gold, where is this extra gold coming from to pay people's on the return? It seems I just I can't see how it can be accounted for in, a, in, a, in an economy with a fixed money supply. Well, I think Deathlands right on that. You know, I think that uh, for once you get uh, a supply of money, uh, which is uh, capable of uh, normally. Uh, serving an economy, uh, when you have an actual um, more uses of the money, you know, the, the price just tends to go up. You know, uh, so the, the set amount of money uh, will, in fact, accommodate any number of transactions. I did have in the 1970s you know, uh, a, uh, an eccentric thought. Uh, no. Um, uh, <laughs> because uh, a book came out by uh, William Rees Marks, who's now dead, he's mm -hmm. sons in Parliament and making a noise now and again uh, on the Conservative right. Uh, and he, he, brought, he brought out a book called The Rain in Guerra uh, in about 1974 on inflation. And he made a big fuss about the velocity of circulation. Mm -hmm. And indeed, Detlev even makes this point that the velocity is important and so on. But I thought, uh, well, if there is no... Uh, you know, the essence of inflation is actually uh, cheating the state cheating the public, as it were. It's kind of like quasi-taxation. Um, if there isn't actually any cheating, uh, if there's just a velocity of circulation, then this can't really add to real inflation. It can't add to uh, the sort of cheating. That's on. So therefore, the velocity of circulation, no matter how rapidly it goes on, uh, basically it's going to settle down and basically you'll have what I used to call in those days, uh, quasi barter. In other words, you'll have a sort of naturalistic economy where goods change roughly as, as you might expect them to change. Now, of course, you never get a situation, I mean, Mises keeps saying time and time again, you know, even with sound money, you're not going to get a lack of flux. But you, what happens, you see, is that any amount of, uh, you have to come back to your original point, any amount of usage of the gold doesn't matter, it doesn't really matter very much. Uh, you you, you do, don't, don't get any extra fraud. And, uh, and I think that that's that, that right when he says a, a fixed amount of, of money that can do 
uh, uh, the actual job of, of, of uh, acting as a medium of exchange can accommodate any number of transactions. Uh, it, 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 when the demand for money goes up, it, what happens is that you just tend to get uh, you know, a, 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 a sort of price on inflation we the price rise and the, in the, you get a, a rise in the uh, amount of, in the money good. You know, in other words, the, you get a, a like demand for anything else. If, if demand for, for carrots goes up, the, 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 the price of carrots tend to go up. Likewise, if demand for money goes up, the, 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 uh, uh, the price of money tends to go up. But the, the one stable supply of money will, in fact, take on any amount of transactions. The velocity, of course, will probably speed up, but I don't think that's damaging at all. In my, yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah. That, by that point, though, that is an eccentric point. I think Dead Left should have a word here. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 I, I just want to add to that point. I mean, I think, I think David, you're absolutely correct. I mean, I, I do think, and hopefully... On I, velocity, though. Hopefully, hopefully I show this in the, book, in the book, that any any quantity of money, and if it's just a fixed amount of money, any kind of within reasonable limits, any amount of money can facilitate all the number of transactions. So I think what I tried to show as a first step is you do not need, even in a growing economy, a growing supply of the monetary asset, whatever it is, whether gold or Bitcoin, whatever it is. And then the other point, the second point of my argument is that it, you, I hope I can show in, in the book that the moment you start adding money to the system, because you have to add it at a certain point in the economy from where it will distribute to through the economy, that process is always disruptive. That's the Cantillon effect. Yes. Yeah, so basically, yeah, which is the basis of all economics. <laughs> but the 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 point, but the point with the calculation is an interesting one because I think if you, well, you can actually argue that in, uh, I would, most economists would argue, and I would agree that in a low inflation or no inflation economy, you can calculate better as a, an entrepreneur as you can in an inflationary one. That, however, is not even my main argument. That is not really my point. But I mean, if you think about it, if you, if you run a business and you have and you generate income, in order to have a going concern, you would have to think about at some stage reinvesting some of your income into replacing machinery or buying new raw materials. I mean, the people who run the bar outside would have to think once they sold all the beer to buy beer again. So, in order to have an idea how profitable their business is, they will have to make an assumption at what price they will rebuy, repurchase more beer or you know, uh, refurbish the bar every five years. And uh, obviously in an inflationary economy, they would have to make the assumption that, I don't know, in two or three years' time, they would buy these materials at a higher price. If we had a gold standard or uh, a system with inelastic money, which I would advocate, then they would have to still make an assumption because they, there's no guarantee that prices will stay stable. There's even not a guarantee that prices will fall. You can reasonably assume that over time they will fall. But if, for example, the demand for money changes, prices will change, as David has just explained. So uh, what I'm basically saying, like, under any monetary system, entrepreneurs will have to make assumptions and have to guess at what costs they will have to rebuy re material. And now, usually in inflationary economies, inflation is high, inflation tends to vary more, and it becomes more difficult to calculate. Um, and, and it's probably the deflationary or low inflation environment is, 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 is better. But to me, that is not even the key point because under any scenario, entrepreneurs will have to make assumptions how they repurchase. Uh, the key point for me is really that if you, if, as most economists argue today, that the economy works better if there is modest inflation in it, in order to generate modest inflation, when the capitalist economy produces deflation, the capitalist economy comes and makes stuff cheaper, you would have to constantly inject money into the economy in order to keep nominal prices rising. And in order to do that, you have to pump money into a certain part of the economy, namely the banking system. And that process, and that is, I think, my key argument, that process must be disruptive. And, and, and that is, I think, that then leads to the trade side of like Mises, but I think that's sort of, uh, I think, the key argument. Well, so some would say the attempt to have stable prices leads to an unstable economy because you're feeding money in the stock price is falling, exactly. but it's fed here, there, or with the aid of a lower interest rate, so... Yeah. But what, you know, in the 19th century, prices were continually falling, oh, uh, as opposed to rising as they are now. And, uh, you know, you had things like the invention of the farthing, for instance, to cater for the uh, falling prices, so you had smaller yes. units. Uh, you know, and that wasn't even throughout the 19th century, you know, there'd be periods where there was falling 
faster than other pyramids. So, I, you know, I'm not, I, I've never been convinced by this, um, this destructive effects of inflation, or gradual inflation. And I think Friedman is okay on that, you know, the gradual inflation. It, I'm not saying, you know, I, I think you have a gradual deflation as well. I think it's rapid changes in prices, which are very destructive. But I, I, I agree, no, I agree with the point that sort of, and, and I think I make that point at some session in the book where I say, the people who argue that if you have 2% inflation every year, like most central bankers today argue that they try to have 2% inflation. And if they achieve that, their argument is, and the Milton Friedman's argument was, then everybody can calculate better because you know it's 2%. But obviously, if you have a fixed supply of money and you assume that the economy broadly gets 2% more productive every year, year or one percent, you would probably assume one percent or two percent deflation. And that's not any worse or better as a basis of calculation. So I fully agree with you. The you know it, once you have broadly on trend sort of slightly predictable if that's the, the, the achievable price trends, it doesn't matter whether it's slight inflation or deflation. So the problem from my point of view does isn't inflation. The problem is in order to get the inflation you have to constantly increase and expand the money supply. And that's why I think I focus on the elasticity of the money supply. That means somebody has to constantly expand the money supply. That process, I hope I show in the book, has to be disrupted in itself. Um, oh, I'll just uh, play devil's advocate here. <laughs> if Hicks does say, uh, and uh, I don't give any credit for it, of course, but he does say that the, you get back to the real economy, get back to natural economy, you get back to an equilibrium, very, very rapid, even with extra inflation, and even with ongoing inflation, I like, uh, protest over this, but uh, this seems to be the thing that uh, old David Steele seems to have uh, grabbed hold of as well, because uh, he thinks that um, you know, um, you're not going to get, uh, he thinks that no one, what he said, he's, the latest thing he said when he sent into the LA list, that uh, there might be a slump in 15 or 20 years' time, but no one can foresee it today. And the way things are going, it, it might not happen as well. So, uh, you know, so I think he has embraced Hicks. And he, he, say, he, say, I, uh, he said uh, that Hicks was a complete revelation to him, which is, uh, uh, since seeing that, I haven't read Hicks, so I want to get hold of my copy of Hicks and read it again and see what this revelation was. But he thought it was a complete revelation that Hicks was right on the ball in the, in the IX story. He certainly... Uh, uh, as I say, certainly from per his personal experience with IAC, which was his, in, uh, extensive, and from his early years, right up to 1967, when he wrote this piece. So it is a, an interesting piece. It's a pity I didn't find it and give you a, a proper uh, exposition of it. We've got enough to go on, I think. Yeah, to what Stephen said, that um, uh, moderate and, co and constant inflation is not disruptive to the economy. Uh, I think then you have to define first what, what means disruptive because um, it's clearly uh, damaging some people. There's, because in order to keep inflation alive, you need to pump in money into the economy, and this money needs to go to some people first. So these people get a privilege, and they can live on, on behalf of, of some savers on, on the other hand. So that, that's what's really happening. And so I, I'm not sure if, if, if we should look at, at the economy as a whole, like like politicians like to do this, the society is better off or whatever to, to disguise what's really going on. Because what's really going on is a quite immoral process of redistribution money from one pocket, uh, or wealth from one pocket uh, to another pocket. And I think that is in itself disruptive. There is a kind of, just to jump in, there is a kind of natural inflation if, you're, if we're just using lumps of gold. You know, if prices are set in in grams of gold, milligrams of gold. And if there's a process of, you know, transforming gold ore into gold, or if a gold, gold seams are found in some country or other, there will be a natural inflation. But hardly, hardly at all as destructive as yeah, well, that's, the paper money. Yeah, but that's more an argument of against gold as money. We just don't have anything better. Well, we well, might, might have Bitcoin, which might be better, I think but, uh, but it, as far as natural uh, elements sure. are concerned, I think gold is still, still yeah. the best, even yeah. though there is some yeah, danger. It's, I think, then, yeah, yeah, first. Um, at first, I thought Steve was saying what I was going to say, which is that you simply have smaller and smaller denominations, um, and 
and therefore you don't have any inflation. But then there seemed to be the idea that that was somehow increasing the money supply and it was some sort of inflation. Is that, is that, is that what people think? That the increasing them, having smaller denominations is inflation? Or? But that's the accounting problem that I was thinking. I mean, smaller denominations would be a solution. Yeah, I mean, and but it, that, would, it would require a change in the way accounting is thinking. Uh, change the way. Uh, well, I mean, but no people. Yeah, I mean, as you, you'll predict what the um, accountancy is done under inflation now. Yeah. I mean, it's just and there would be a change to accountancy. In methods. the same way that you, that yeah. you beforehand, you would say, well, we expect the currently currency will inflate by so much. We expect, mm -hmm. well, we expect it will be so worth so much more, and mm -hmm. taking that into account will give you such and such an interest rate, and that that yeah. just probably just solved. Well, that sounds well, like. No, but sorry to jump in, but if prices are falling, that's deflation. No. So, if a smaller coin does as much work as a previous coin, that's deflation. That's, that's deflation. Yeah. So, Steve was saying deflation, actually. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah, Steve said. If you get deflation, then because the goods are costing less, then you bring in new coinage like a farthing that was yeah. brought in the, in the 19th century to cater for this. Just as I can just about remember the farthing from the 1950s, it went in uh, 19, by 1960 because of inflation. And. Uh, I bought some I with the father. Yes, it went on the blackjack. Sorry. We've yes. lost the half penny of the last yeah. 30 or 40 years. No, I've, I've told McDee here, I did buy a sweet. Yes, a blackjack. Four for a penny, a blackjack. Well, three pence. But the point is, that's how I'm money with deal with. With, with the farthing that I found in the gutter. I wasn't drunk and woke up next to the farthing. I was only 10 years old. But I did buy something for a farthing. And for what it's worth, it was a modern, it was a modern sweet shop, and you had a basket that you put your purchases in, a little basket like that, and the blackjack kept falling into the holes. So I had to carry the basket in one hand, go to the counter and put the blackjack down, no, put the basket down, put the blackjack in it and produce my farthing. Anyway, this is by the by. This gentleman is next. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I agree with Detlef that the, the key idea here is the idea of disruption. Uh, I think it it can be quite difficult to see what the problem is when you're talking about money being injected into the banking system because it's all a bit abstruse and all a bit obscure. So I, I, I like to think of a, a thought experiment which perhaps illustrates what we mean by disruption a bit more clearly. And the thought experiment that I, uh, I've come up with is this. The government prints new money, but instead of injecting it through the banking system, it uses it to subsidise apple growers, and it subsidises vast quantities of apple growing, so that uh, we have uh, orchards everywhere, displacing other activities, because all the new money is now being used to employ people to plant apple trees and pick them and provide distribution of apples incredibly cheaply. Is that disruptive or not? It seems to me the answer plainly is yes because it's causing resources to be allocated in a way that would not otherwise occur, but for this process. And although it, it, it might be difficult to articulate exactly what the problem is, intuitively, there is a serious problem there, because a lot of stuff is being done that, that wouldn't otherwise be done and doesn't reflect what preferences would otherwise be. And I think it's easier to see what we mean by disruption, if we use that sort of example, than when we think about injection in, into the banking system. But in principle, I think it's the same thing. Yes. And if you take the view that converting a quarter of the country into apple production by these vast subsidies through money printing is a bad thing, then I think it must follow from that that you agree that any money injection of new money into the economy anywhere, at any time, in any way, is similarly a bad thing, mm. the way that I see it anyway. You, you could make the point even clearer and more dramatic if you said the rent boys instead of apple <laughs> production. I'll leave that in <laughs> But yes, it's but it, would make, it, would, it would make it clearer. Unless, that, unless, just, unless it's simply the entry, the entry of more gold <laughs> to make more coins, that would have far less disruptive effect. Because it wouldn't be given to anybody. It wouldn't, it wouldn't donate it, you know, as a first receiver. Maybe different forms of injection in different places yeah. may disrupt to a different extent. Yeah. But I, I think that sort of 
more captures the idea no, I think you're right. of all I think, you're right. I, I, think I, I don't know what. But I, I, I think, I mean, Detlef will uh, control what I say, but I, I think it's even you know, quite clear um, and uh, clearer than your very good analogy of apples. Uh, what you see is the immense development, not of apples, but the banking system, mm. the financial system, the derivatives market, the stock market, and the property market. So all completely uh, speculative activities, which do not generate any new wealth, simply inflate assets. Because it's not that the central bank pumps money into the system, it is the banking system that creates money. It is commercial banks that create money, a lot more than the central bank does. So um, what, what you have is this explosion of new money and the continuum effect that Nico referred to um, works full blast. So you have banking creating, banks creating money and keeping money to themselves. Why, if you create money, why would you give it to other people? I mean, you keep it within the realm of your activity. Yeah, I think I think that I mean it's it's obviously difficult. I mean I think it's because it's a, it's almost an empirical point. It's difficult to uh, see how our economy would have developed if they had had hard money. I mean, it's I, I agree with Christian in the sense that because the fiat money economy and the massive monetary expansion we had since we came off board properly in 1971. Uh, I do think that the financial system and these asset markets are artificially inflated. So I agree with that point. But I also think if we, because if you have a hard money economy, you would have growing productivity and therefore growing income and people get wealthier, they're safe more, and those savings need to be allocated. And so that would also, that would also lead to a, a, a growing financial industry, for example. So, so in, in a way I would say, even in a hard money economy, I would expect the financial sector in a wealthier economy to become bigger. Because there are people who have savings that need to be allocated to companies, and that process requires financial markets or financial services. So I think financial services are, as a bigger share of the economy, are a sign of a more developed economy. But I agree with you that that process has been artificially boosted by the massive expansion of money through modern central banking and modern fiat money. So, uh, yeah, it's a massive misallocation of assets. And not only misallocation of financial assets and so on, but the financial sector is draining all the best brains in the country. I mean, people who read I'm not uh, going. Uh, yeah, physics and Cambridge, <laughs> or and so on, go into financial, sec into financial sector, but that's where the money is. So it has all these sort of perverse effects uh, rippling through the whole economy. Yeah. yeah. You, you say you, you talked at the beginning a bit about Marx, and uh, of course one of the big things of the Marxists is the coming collapse of the capitalist system. Uh, and yes. um, one That's of the right. things about the uh, Miesian theory is the coming collapse of the uh, right, yes. capitalist system. Yes, it? that's right, yeah. Both. Uh, well, someone is bound to say, and I'll put it now, because it, someone has to say it, that yes. we don't see a collapse of the capitalist system, do we? No. We see crises, which we always see. We, yes. saw them, we talked about deflation in the 19th century. We, come, we had huge crises there, you know, the railway yes. and boom. Well, crises is a misnomer. All sorts of things. The crisis is uh, a misnomer. And within our lifetimes, we've all seen massive rises in standard of living. Uh, I've lived long enough to see that. I think most people. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Quite um, long enough. So there, there is this obvious point is, you, you know, the system is sort of not just staggering along, is it? It's producing rises in the standard of living yes. of a dramatic nature. Yes. And um, I think that has to be explained. Yeah, well, I think you'd explain that. I mean, it's explained by. By, by the fact that the capitalist system is producing wealth. And as uh, Simon, I think Simon is certainly... Yeah, but not just the capitalist system, but present paper money. Uh, yeah, well, system, the capitalist system... Well, the, well, the, at least for 40 years. Uh, more than 40 years. Uh, but but, but uh, it's, it's true that the, uh, the, the uh, crisis in... Uh, the, the collapse of capitalism and the collapse of, uh, of paper money tend to take uh, an analogy, and I think this is what's impressing David recently. Uh, you know, he says that in one of his, one or two of his internet talks, uh, that uh, you know, uh, the, the current system, whatever we think of it, is, is pretty successful. It's been around for, for some time. And, and uh, uh, I think that uh, you know, the, the we're, we're in, within the Marxist uh, uh, debating circles, 
Uh, some Marxists, of course, said that capitalism will not collapse. And there was a, a small school of uh, Marxists that held that the idea that capitalism was going to collapse is a myth. Well, uh, 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 now, Detlev does say in some, some parts of his book, it is going on for a fair time. You know, he, in fact, he, he tends to, uh, whilst he doesn't agree with it, he tends to think that uh, the first point of uh, t Tullock is not too bad, you know, the inflation is going on and on and on. Uh, it is taking some time to... Now, you see, if, if Hicks is right, and I think there might be something to Hicks, he might not be completely right, but there might be something to Hicks, namely that you can get an equilibrium with, with, with inflated money, then, of course, there is nothing... You know, this idea that I mentioned earlier on, this nice paradox, that the, more, the longer the longer we put it, the more dire the uh, collapse it's going to be. That uh, is a kind of like, that looks like one of Bacon's false idols, actually, because it's a sort of rewarding little paradox unto itself. And if you read Bacon and the false idols, you'll find that there are certain ideas that are like archetypes that give intellectual satisfaction, you know, a bit like the virgin birth, if you like, you know, where, uh, you know, the old, uh, the, 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 the Greek speaking Jews are translating the old uh, Hebrew documents, they don't really know what they mean, because uh, they, they, they now are speaking Greek, the old Christianity is a Greek phenomenon, the old New Testament is in Greek, so they translate this maiden as virgin, and of course, the insight comes, with God, anything's possible, therefore we have a virgin birth. Wow, great, you know, great insights. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and of course, they're right if God existed. Anything would be possible. You know, the question is whether God exists or not. But anyway, they have, they, so they're maiden, so they go from maiden to virgin, which is, uh, you know, the maiden is in, in, in English, language, English language anyway ambiguous. Virgin is not at all ambiguous. It means uh, a woman is never. A liar. Uh, it means a woman is never <laughs> indulged in sexual activity. But anyway. <laughs> Yeah, that's the sort of thing that you get. So, likewise, you get you, 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 you know, this this business of, of of the of the slump getting more dire the more it goes on. Well, that might not be true, but that lives anyway. That lives. Yeah, 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 well, right he's coming. Sure. I think he's here. No, first. I was just thinking. Yeah, that, but I think capitalism is no, but at least the living standards we get from it is robust. But there are countries that do manage to plunge themselves into absolute desperation. Zimbabwe or some but yeah, there are, there, there are countries where they used to have a high standard of being everybody was well off that have managed to absolutely miserate themselves through passing about with the economy. There's a world of difference between drinking <laughs> a pint of beer a day, a day and drinking ten pints of beer a day, you know. And I don't doubt that uh, something like high inflation, like Zimbabwe, is very damaging. But mm. I, I, I'm just arguing that this gradual inflation company or, or it doesn't seem to be bringing the system down. Or, or even like in, in Germany, it must be such a shock, you end up saying all kinds of political horror. Mm. I think I should make a Rothbardian point here, which is that if, if more gold enters the system, there's no reason why there should be a lower interest rate, I think. Some people think that there's a shortage of money, therefore there's... No, no. You get the same interest rate with any, any amount of money. It's the injection. Now, if it's a slow trickle from South Africa or whatever it might be, then that won't be quite so disruptive as, you know, shovel loads arriving... Of, of, not, even, not even paper money. Uh, we're nearly there. Uh, opportunity cost mm. uh, is what you have to look at here. And, yeah. and it, it may well seem that we have a very robust economy, uh, but there's been a compound loss due to the government activity, which means we're probably living in a sort of technological past compared to what we would have had at the government. Not that it been so much. We would. We'd have our flying cars by now that they've been growing us on the for so long. That sort of thing. We'd all just be so much fantastically wealthier than we are. So it's no uh, sort of defence of the current system that, uh, well, it's, you know... We'd still be discontent. We're still getting more. Prices are still falling. You know. if, we, if we were all better off, as you suggest, we'd still be discontented. I'd still want more. <laughs> right. I, I, I can actually... <laughs> the Mises theory that the system is going to crack it yeah. and come down. It's not that we couldn't do better. But, Here first, then back to the tip. Yeah, I mean, this is really just uh, the, 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 there are two issues. One is, is state interference in the money supply, including state interference in interest rates, disruptive so that we are worse off than we would have been if, if it had not been done? And it seems to me that there can only sensibly be one answer to that question. The more difficult question 
is whether if that interference continues, it must necessarily lead to some event, some accelerating catastrophic event. And I think probably that's what Steve is, uh, is, is questioning. That, uh, that it, it may well be that money injections, continued money injections, are disruptive, they mean that we're worse off, and we continue to be worse off at a compounding rate. But does it follow from that that there will be a collapse, or will we just continue with low to moderate inflation for centuries and centuries? It may be a collapse. There may be a terrible debt problem in certain countries. Well, I'd, I'd wish to know what... But what over here first. Yeah, that, I mean, my, my sure. thesis is so yes, that there will be a collapse. I think it follows from the Misesian theory. And it's not the end of capitalism, and it's not because, obviously, you know, Mises was a capitalist, and so am I, and capitalism obviously works. It's the only thing that works, and it's the reason why we continue to get more prosperous. So that's not a conflict to the thesis. The thesis says, if you have a monetary system in which you constantly inject money, you constantly create distortions, and in order to speak with Hicks, in order to, yeah. for the natural economy to be in line again with the money economy, you need the, the recession or the slump is the, uh, is the process by which the two of them go in line. So, yes. so the monetary expansion needs the monetary economy to do that, and then sooner or later they need to come together again by the, by the collapse. And to, to, to David Ramsey Steele, I would say, we see collapses all the time. We had a massive boom in U.S. housing since 2003 to 2007, and, and there the two economies were brought into equilibrium again, to speak with Hicks, through the financial crisis of 2007, 2008. These are exactly the kind of boom-bust cycles we well, speak about. But I think the key point here for me is, for the last 40 years, now that central banking, modern central banking, and therefore state management of the money supply, is unconstrained. And this is the new thing. I mean, we moved away from a gold standard for the last 100 years. What is really new over the last 40 years is that modern central banking, state managed money, has no constraints. There are no inbuilt constraints on how much central banks can interfere in the monetary system. Then I would argue now, because the, the, whenever these dislocations are being dissolved now, it's painful and politically unwanted, so we, the, inter, the, the interventions get more aggressive. And this is something I think we've seen over the last 20 years clearly, we see this to this day. Since the financial crisis of 2008, which brought, again according to Hicks, the money economy and the national economy back together, the political fallout of that, which meant you know, banks going under, state declaring bankruptcy, which we did not want, the central banks have intervened, intervened even more forcefully. For six years now, we have zero interest rates in the world, and we have all central banks interfering into various asset markets directly, quantitative easing, all these policies. Now, my argument is to say, this is not just uh, an inter intermediate stage. This, this has to continue. This is the natural next point. The central banks, in, in previous times, central banks will start buying equities or real estate. They will, they will have to do more. They will interfere more, because they have to keep their fingers into ever more holes of that sort of artifice that have built up over the last four years. And th there is a point where I, my, my question in the end of the book is so there is a point where this has to go one way or the other. Either we reach a point where we say, okay, fine, we have to let the cleansing occur and let the market bring the money economy and the real economy in, into equilibrium again, and that's painful. Or you keep printing money, and at some stage, that has usually in the history of paper money systems led to the point where the public loses confidence. I don't know even what it is. I don't know what, how this will pan out. I'm not even saying I can forecast that. Yeah, but, it, but I see that tension is still in the system. It's, it's palpable today. Yeah, but if, 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 if someone had said to us, me, you, and Bob say, uh, 15 years ago, that you'd have this thing quantitative easing, pushing this amount of money in, what we've seen just lately, you know, I mean, you're quite right, it has gone exponentially up. But, but the point is, I think we would have said at first glance, the system can't stand that amount of money. And it does. And it does. And, and David Steele has said in his latest post on this to the list, quantitative easing, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't seem to do any damage at all to the economy. Now, that is a Hickian type. Now, what Hick says, you see, I mean, the difference between, let me go over the difference between Ix and Ix again. Uh, they both agree on the natural economy and the money economy. Hicks thinks that a large amount of inflation brings a short, if the ephemeral uh, uh, 
dislocation or lag, if you like, between the natural economy and the money economy. And then it corrects again. And, and it's corrected on, on distorted terms, but it's basically a re-emergence of the natural economy. In other words, it's dispelled, whereas Hayek says, along with you, me, Bob, uh, us three 15 years ago, and perhaps us three even tonight, because I said that I'm playing devil's disciple here, I basically have still got two feet in, in the Austrian th or in the Mesian theory, and you know, just some a few hands outside the window, as it were. Uh, but even now we say that this makes it more and more dire. But if Hicks is half right, it's not going to get more and more dire at all. Being beaten every morning, the same amount of strokes may not get any more dire, but it's painful and un un unnecessary. Uh, oh, certainly. Uh, but, but, but the point is, is, is something building up? You know, that if you put it off enough and off, enough, it'll get worse. You know, in other words, it's expand. The actual crunch itself is going to get inevitably worse the longer it goes on, which is the pet, which I called in, in this title, uh, I called it a, Bac a Baconian false idol. Because it's got the, the sense of paradox and the, a bit like the virgin birth, it's a sort of exciting idea. It's, it's, it's an idea that's intellectually exciting, this idea that the longer we put it off, the more it's going to go on. That is a reason for thinking that we, we're indulging in intellectual activity here rather than real analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, I'm just playing to that as a disciple. I think you have two factors um, why we, we did not have massive inflation. One is globalization. We were, we have been buying for the last 20, 20 China, years India, uh, cheaper and cheaper and cheaper products coming from China, Malaysia and all these places. Yeah. Now, normally, our standard of living in the West should have gone shooting up because we were, our purchasing power was so much greater because of globalization. It didn't happen, uh, so it masked the rampant inflation that central banks and the banking system was created, creating. Uh, the other thing, of course, is the massive creation of money hasn't gone into the natural economy. It has stayed in this bubble of derivatives and so on. The GDP of the world, the production of all stuff, is about 75 to 80 trillion dollars. The internet, well, the, sorry, the bubble, the financial bubble, is like 10 times greater. Now, if that money had gone into the mainstream, this would have been Zimbabwe. But it remained confined to this bubble. So we didn't have massive inflation that we should have had. Uh, the question is, how do you uh, prick the bubble without creating a wave of bank, bank going under, uh, banks going under and so on, and without creating the deflation that uh, we have. Massive deflation um, that we are starting to have. The, because we, you have a massive liquidation of assets which could last, you know, uh, a very long time. I mean, years and years. Um, as people have to sell, you know, the equity is under the mortgage, they have to sell their, their property, uh, then it creates sort of housing uh, building society is going bust, uh, so you have a cycle of deflation. Yes, and this is what they're putting off with the quantitative easing, isn't it? This is what they're dreading, yeah. they're putting so off. You have, you have two so the, conflicting forces. You have a deflationary pressure on, on one hand, and you have an inflationary with banks sort of rebuilding the balance sheet, all these sort of things that Detlef could speak more locally than I could, and, and inflation being you know, propping up all this, all this system. I wouldn't start from here, as the Irishman no, yeah, said. Exactly, that's right. <laughs> yeah, we're bound, as, as the Irishman said, we're bound to start from here. Uh, yeah, I, th I think if the, if the interest rates goes up, uh, th thanks for thinking very much. Um, if the interest rates goes up, there are going to be a lot of people in trouble. There's no doubt about that. If, the, if there yeah, is a return, yeah. if there is a return to the uh, to natural interest rates, there are, is going to be a lot of trouble. A lot of people in trouble in the short run. Even people in this room will be in trouble, I guess. If there were a purging of um, the unsound back in 2008, there would have been a lot less troublesome, I'm sure. I mean, everything of importance in the world in the way of real output, intelligence, capital, skills, you know, plants, water, ships, the whole thing was there. Everything that really delivers our real income 
was there. Now, some people would have to find what they thought was a good investment, a zip investment. Some banks would have had to go, but there were plenty of people, there's plenty of money out there willing to start new banks, banks that could expand, banks that were good, that could say, all right, wipe that off, we'll, we'll be the bank. Um, this is a point made by the chap whose name I can never remember, uh, the American fellow. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is it could have been... What did you go say? No, the other one. It could have been done. Mm. It was not done. And now we have pumped, 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 puffed it up even further, so it's perhaps not so easy to do. Well, there's a, there's a second player, of course, to the economy uh, when it comes to quantitative easing, and that is the government who needs to borrow more, more money. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. this player actually is pumping some of this money into the real economy because they're paying salaries with it, they're, they're, paying, they're paying products with it. So that's why we haven't seen deflation in, in actually consumer uh, prices uh, that much. They're, they are still going down despite the cries of, of huge deflation coming. Even, even the official con uh, pr consumer price index is, is essentially going up. And um, so we could, we could get out of this, I think, of, of without inflation by just letting a deflationary collapse in the economy if it wasn't for the government also being a one player who is hugely indebted and that would mean that in, in order to see this really deflation play out we would need to see politicians basically stepping in front of, of, of their electorate and saying look we are, we are bankrupt we're not financing your salary anymore mm -hmm. and I don't see that happening if that, so, so, but that's a different analysis from, from pure economics, I think. Purely economically, the whole thing is very deflationary and, and should collapse deflationary. But bringing this uh, political dimension of, of the political system not, not being able to, to basically be honest and, and default, uh, I think you get a lot of deflationary, uh, inflationary pressure. In. Last answer, David? Well, uh, I mean, I, I think there is, there is definitely a lot of readjustment that will come if they ended quantitative easing. But uh, my guess is they're going to continue quantitative easing for some time to come. It, you know, it, it is now, uh, I think Detlef says uh, they've, they've tried it three times, they've brought it to a stop a few times, but it's now becoming normal policy. And it looks like it's quantitative easing for the, uh, for the foreseeable future, I guess. And, uh, you know, it's, it's going to save the... The, the French is going to postpone the French a bit, but uh, uh, the question arises whether they can postpone the French indefinitely. And uh, well, they've, they've, as people have pointed out, they've done all right the last few decades. Perhaps, perhaps, it's, perhaps we need, perhaps we need more decades than any of us got to, to see to see when this uh, this readjustment will come. Our works are imperishable, David. They will. Well, we, I mean, well, we, yeah, but our works might be imperishable, but we're not. <laughs> and uh, I don't suppose we'll be around in a hundred years' time to see if Mises was right. <laughs> <laughs> we know he was right now. And then, and for the future. Oh, well, that was very good. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. <laughs>